Hello and welcome to Noel's Retro Lab. Today we're going to go back to that ZX Spectrum 128K toast rack that we saw a few weeks ago, the one that had so many chips destroyed, and we're going to try and come up with a replacement for each of the damaged parts. Before we get started, I just have a quick announcement to make. I just set up a Patreon account, so for those of you interested in supporting the channel, that's probably the best way to do it. It will allow me to spend more time making videos, so hopefully I'll make more and better videos. No pressure at all though, you're totally welcome to continue watching and enjoying the videos like you've done up until now. I just wanted to mention this now because I just set it up, but don't worry, I'm not going to be interrupting videos in the future and nagging you anymore about this. Thank you. When we left off last time, these were all the parts we had to take out of that poor ZX Spectrum 128K. The transistor and the Z80 we already replaced with new ones. The other ones are the ones we'll tackle today. So let's start with the ZX8401. The ZX8401, and sometimes referred to as the PCF1306P, or even an Amstrad 40058, they're really all the same chip, was a custom chip designed by Sinclair to combine a bunch of discrete logic used for memory addressing and that way reduce manufacturing costs. Because it's a custom chip, we can't just buy a brand new one off eBay, and the only way to get it is really to scavenge it from an existing ZX Spectrum. Fortunately, it's a relatively straightforward chip since it just combines some basic logic, so instead of taking it from another poor specy, we're going to make our own version. So let's see what exactly this chip does, and then we'll figure out how to make one. When the ZX Spectrum was first released, it came with 16K and 48K. Let's first look at the 16K configuration because it's easier. Here we have the CPU, Z80, and the 16K of RAM. When the CPU wants to read, you would think that the Z80 could put whatever address he wants into the address bus and do a read from the RAM. In practice, it's not quite so simple. The Z80 has a 16-bit address bus. You need to have that many bits in order to access 64K of RAM. The RAM chips are 4116s, which each have 16 kilobits, not kilobytes, kilobits. In order to address all 16 kilobits, we need 14 bits of address space. But the RAM chips only have seven address input pins. And with seven bits, we can only access 128 bytes. So what's going on? Ideally, RAM chips would have more pins, but that would make them much larger and probably much more expensive. So instead, RAM chips have half as many address pins as they usually need, but then have a column address signal, usually written as CAS, and a row address signal, RAS, that allows us to interface with the RAM chips by first entering half the address and triggering the RAS signal, and then entering the other half and triggering CAS. In order to do that as quickly and efficiently as possible, the ZX Spectrum involves some extra hardware, the ULA and a multiplexer. A multiplexer is a device that takes two or more inputs and lets us select which of them we want as an output. The lower 14 bits of the 16-bit address bus of the Z80 are put through a multiplexer. So in this particular case, the input is 14 bits and the output will be 7 bits. So the ULA first selects half of it and turns on the CAS signal for the RAM, and then selects the other half and turns the RAS signal. At that point, the RAM chips can complete the operation and either put the data on the data bus in case of a read, or write it into the RAM itself in case of a write. Technically, they didn't need to use the ULA for that, there's much easier ways, but the ULA is already manipulating those signals to read memory independently of the CPU to generate the video image like we've seen in other videos. That was pretty straightforward, right? It gets a bit more complicated with 48K, but the principle is the same. I'm not going to get into all the details, but very roughly, it's like this. The upper RAM is 32K mapped between the addresses of 4000 hex to 8000 hex, so we can use the high bit of the address bus, A15, to know we're accessing an address at that location. We also have a multiplexer like before, and some discrete logic made out of NAND and OR gates to generate CAS, RAS, and the multiplexer select signal. All of that together with the 16K logic is what was combined inside the PCF chip, and that started with issue 5 boards. As an aside, the upper RAM is implemented with 4164 chips, which are 64 kilobits, again, each. Since we have eight of them, that's technically 64 kilobytes of RAM, not 32 kilobytes of RAM. Does that really mean that Sinclair put 72 kilobytes of RAM but only made 48K accessible? <laughs> not a chance, knowing Sinclair. They actually used defective 
RAM chips on purpose to get bottom prices on their chips. These were chips that had some errors, but half of the addresses were working properly. So they hardwired one address to high or low and used them as 32 kilobytes of RAM using the half of it that was working correctly. Talk about thrifty savings. There's even a link on the board to swap between the two kinds of defective chips, the ones with errors on one half versus the ones with errors on the other half. So that way they were able to buy them all and use them all. So now that we know what's going on in that custom chip, how do we go about making our own version? We could do it again with discrete logic, but it would get really crammed on those boards. We could also create a chip like that in a variety of ways. We could use a CPLD that would be compact, but could be kind of overkill for this. Nowadays, we could use SMD components to replicate the exact same original circuit, but have a much smaller footprint. Jose Leandro went through this reverse engineering a while back and came up with a design for a board using through-hole components, and since that was kind of huge, another design using SMD components. Those designs are publicly available for anybody to use and make their own boards, and I put the links in the description. And actually, I had coincidentally joined a group in a retro forum a few months ago that created a batch of these boards and sold them as a kit. So here's that kit. Let's build them and try them out. I ordered two kits, so this is enough to make two of them. And this is the main PCB, so it's pretty small, exactly the size of the PCF chip. And it has room for three of those SMD integrated circuits on one side and three on the other side. And that's everything. The PCBs, the integrated circuits, which is just some logic gates, and the multiplexers, a few capacitors, and a row of pins. <laughs> Couldn't be any simpler. So I know that SMD components can be intimidating sometimes, so I'm going to go over the process that I use to solder them. I am by no means an expert at SMD soldering, but I get by okay with at least this size. When they get much smaller, then it starts being more complicated. So the very first thing I do is to try to clean the pads as well as I can with some alcohol. Then once they're clean, I apply some flux. I only have this liquid thing. I suspect it's not as good as that paste flux that you see in some places, but you know, it's better than nothing. Then the trick is to place the chip, by the way, with the correct orientation, very important, as center as you can on the pads. This might take a while going back and forth. Uh, you really should try to get it as straight and centered as possible. And then what I do is carefully solder one corner to keep the chip in place and then the opposite corner. Once that's in place, I check that it's centered and it's still straight and all the pins are making good contact with the pads. And then I apply some solder to the chisel tip and move it over every single pin. And this part is actually really easy. Between the flux and the pads on the PCB, it's just very straightforward and the solder just goes in the right places. Then I do the same thing on the other side and there you go. The chip looks pretty good to me. And that's pretty much it. Now you just repeat the process with all the other SMD chips. And then as usual with any kind of soldering, I like to clean the flux residue. So I apply some alcohol, I scrub it really well, and then use some kind of a rag to soak up the remaining liquid and flux and take it all away from the board and leave it nice and clean. All there's left now are the capacitors. Those are just through holes, so that should be very easy. And finally, for the pin headers, what I normally do is, is I put it on a breadboard. That way I know they're completely straight. I fit the PCB on top, and then I can solder them really easily. And there you go, all done. So let's go ahead and swap the chip with the one we just made. It's a drop-in replacement. You put it the right side up. And if all goes well, this should work exactly the same as before. And that's looking very good. Yeah, works great. So that was a successful replacement of the PCF chip. Since I built two of them, let me try the other one, just to be sure. And oh no, that's not working right. So there's clearly something wrong with the second PCF replacement that I built, and this is showing every other RAM bank failing. So I suspect it may not even be detecting the upper RAM. Let's have a look at it. 
So I've set up the chip on this breadboard to test it in isolation from the rest of the ZX spectrum. And in particular, I'm suspecting the problem might be with this um, NAND gate is the 74LS00. And that's because this generates, or it's part of the circuit that generates the signals for row address and column address for the um, high, the upper RAM. So this, the way I've set it up right now, I'm just powering the circuit with five volts over here to pin 40 and ground pin 20, just like in the spectrum. And when you look at the circuit of what this implements, um, there's one very easy test we can do, which is gates one and two are connected to the um, read and write signals on pin 38 and 39. So we could just check is to see if this is working, or at least that particular um, that particular gate, there's four different gates on that chip. If this is working and we, we can apply zero or one, depending on whether we connect them to five volts or ground. So let's let's try that. I'm gonna connect for now to ground. So I got this one of them connected to ground and the other one as well. Okay. Just like that. And just to make sure that things are set up correctly, I'm going to see if we have connectivity between ground right here. And this first pin, there we go. And second pin, okay. So those are the two pins that we're going to be going, they're going to be going to ground. Those are pins one and two. And so number three, because this is a NAND gate, it should give us a one. So it's only going to give us zero when both pins one and two are one. And I've switched this to voltage. So let's measure the voltage. First of all, let's make sure that we're getting zero. Yeah, and zero. Okay. And then if all goes well, this should be five volts in pin three. And we get 0.58 volts. That's, that's clearly bad. That's uh, not zero. That's not five it's this weird intermediate thing and the good thing about doing this check is that this is not this particular signal is not really connected to anything else other than the chip itself so just by doing that we can tell that this chip is faulty and we should replace it so i just realized that we should run the same test on the chip that is actually working so we can indeed see that we're supposed to get five volts in pin three We need to put this in exactly in the right, in the same position. And let's run the same test. I'm gonna power it on and testing voltage in pin one, zero, pin two, zero, and pin three, yeah, 4.75. That's, that's close enough to five. That's definitely a one, a logical one. So this is working correctly. We already have all the tools out, so let's go ahead and replace that chip now. First, let's secure the board in place. It's important that it doesn't move while we're working on it. Now I'm going to use the heat gun and I'm going to set it to something like 300 degrees Celsius. And I apply the heat slowly to the board and move it around a little bit to try to get it as uniform as possible. I check it every so often just to see if the chip starts to move. Nothing, so I keep doing it a little bit more. Okay, now we moved a little bit. Just needs a little bit more heat. And there you go, it comes right off. Now it's a matter of cleaning the pads well with a desoldering braid and cleaning them with some alcohol, adding some flux, and then soldering it again like we did before. Let's run those diagnostics again. And great, everything passes this time. So that was definitely it. All right, with the PCF out of the way, let's turn our attention to the ULA. The ULA is a particularly scary chip to damage because it's also a custom chip, but it's a lot more complicated. So it's not nearly as easy to replace as the PDF. It's possible, 
but the versions out there right now are rather expensive, around the 20 euro mark. Last episode, when I pulled out the ULA from the faulty spectrum and put it on the working 128K, this is what it looked like. This is a total ghosty mess. So when I went to try it on this computer, I was expecting the same thing, but I got this instead. Wow, that's almost perfect. It's actually not totally perfect. There's still a ghosting effect. You can see it around the 1985 Sinclair. And this is the comparison between the good ULA and this ULA. I also tried this on the other computer just to see if it was some weird mismatch between the ULA and the computer. And now I'm still getting this same very slight ghosting, nothing like last time. And when we display a different image, the artifact changes a little bit. Here is not so much of a ghosting anymore as it's the last letter in a line get some extra pixels there. That's really weird. As far as the ULA, let's have a look at the RGB signals being outputted by the ULA. I'm not sure we'll be able to see anything because there was this ghosting effect, which was more pronounced one time than the next time. But because we were seeing that through the RGB connector, it couldn't have been anything related to the PAL encoder. It really had to come from the ULA. Besides, in that same board, we put the other ULA and we see the perfect image. So there is something fishy going on about the RGB signals. And I don't think it could be the sync signal either because it seemed, the image seemed very solid and centered correctly. It was just the color values were slightly shifted and repeated in this ghosting effect. So let's have a look at them. Maybe we'll see some slight differences. So let's start with pin 19, which is blue. And that looks totally reasonable. The, um, yeah, the signals take a little bit to charge in there, but I can't imagine there's anything to worry about. This seems pretty normal. That curve, that looks totally fine. So because I've just turned on the spectrum like this. What we're seeing, these are, this is the message at the bottom of the screen. The you know Sinclair research, whatever, different letters. Let's see, next channel. Yeah, it looks totally fine. Okay, so let's try the ULA that works correctly. See if we see any difference. And let's start with 19 as well. So the blue channel. And that to me looks exactly the same as the other as the other ULA. Yeah, let's try next channel. Yeah, same charging curve, same kind of noise at the bottom. Yeah, so I don't see anything significantly different just looking with the oscilloscope. So I did a little bit more digging and looked at the sync signal and everything seemed the same. And then I realized the cable I'm using to connect it to the TV has the battery plug-in. I normally never plug in anything and it always looks fine, but it's clearly there for a reason. So what happens if we put a battery there? And this is what happens. Perfect image quality. You can even see the difference as I remove the battery and then I put it back in. I'm just blown away that one ULA will look great without it and the other one will have that ghosting effect without that battery. Now, why is that battery there? In a SCART cable, apart from the RGB and syncing signals, there are also some other signals that tell the TV how to interpret the data. Specifically, pin 16 is the blanking signal. And if you pass no voltage or very little voltage, the TV should interpret the signal as a composite video. Whereas if you pass anywhere between one and three volts, then the TV will interpret it as an RGB signal. This particular spectrum model doesn't have any voltage to draw from in the video connector, unlike some other models like the plus two. So Technically, it should have been interpreting mm, the signal without the battery as composite video, although I really doubt it because the image quality was really good. 
But the really puzzling thing is that with one ULA, it was behaving differently than with the other ULA. And that is something that I still haven't understood why that could even possibly happen. So if you have an idea of why that could be happening, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to find out more about this mystery. And finally, we're just left with replacing the ROM, which seemed to work initially, but it was causing those tests to fail, probably because it was messing with the data bus. Fortunately, the ROM is socketed and is very straightforward to replace it with an EEPROM. First of all, I'm going to read the EEPROM from the working ROM on the good 128K. Since this is a 32K ROM, I'm going to select some 27, 256 EEPROM chip. And I'll disable the pin check because I don't know the exact brand of this EEPROM. It doesn't really matter. And there we go. He reads it correctly. And I'm going to save it out. I'm going to call it good just so we can compare it with the other one. And now let's pop in the bad EEPROM and let's attempt to read it just like we did with the other one. So it actually reads fine, which is interesting. I was half expecting it to fail the read. That's very often what happens when you have a bad EEPROM. And let's save this as bad, and that way we'll do the comparison. Let's compare it against the good data that we read from the first EEPROM. And yeah, there are definitely differences there. So, And they were supposed to be exactly the same. So yeah, not only was the EEPROM interfering with the data bus, but actually its contents were bad. So that's definitely good that we're replacing it. And then just for kicks, I reread the bad EEPROM again. I, since it was kind of working, I was wondering whether we would always read the same data every time or it would actually read different data. So I saved it as bad two, and let's run a comparison with bad. And actually, yeah, they're exactly the same. So at least with this particular hardware, these two times it actually read the exact same data. But we know that the data is bad and is not what was supposed to be there originally. So let's write the good data to a new 32K EEPROM. All right, the data was written without any problems. Now let's pop it on the board and see if that works. Let's run the same tests that we did before. And it's looking good. And yeah, everything is passing. So this looks like the right fix. We had to replace that EEPROM with anyone. And just to make sure, one last test. Let's turn it on. And yeah, the basic prompt is there. So I think this board is good to go. And one last touch, I'm going to transfer that sticker to here. Not because the window needs to be protected, because it really doesn't. It's not going to get erased just with the regular sunlight, and especially inside a case of a computer, but just because it's so iconic, the sticker, the handwritten sticker. So we might as well put it over here. It's not going to stick very well because yeah, it's not sticky at all. So we'll just put a little bit of glue. And as you can see, this was the exact same EEPROM that we chose, a 27C or 27256, which is a 32K EEPROM. And there we go. We put the EEPROM in place. And perfect. We have a fully working ZX Spectrum 128K board, which we had to replace a lot of things from here. So it's good that it's all working as good as new, even with the modern replacement of that chip. So that wasn't as complicated as I feared. Certainly being able to reuse the ULA was a big relief. The other chips were pretty easily replaceable. I hope that was useful to you. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below or anywhere in social media. I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Until next video, see you then.